Hello, thanks so much for joining us at Show Studio. Today, my panel and I will be discussing Gucci post Alessandro Michele. And to start off, we'll just do some brief introductions. My name's Emily Zak. I'll be chairing the panel. My name is Aya Ojo. I'm a fashion student at Central St. Martins and also the founder of the Fashion Archive. My name's Mandy Leonard, and I'm the founder of creative agency Mandy's Basement. I'm Andrew Davis. I'm a stylist based in London. I'm Jeannie and Anne Lewin, and I'm creative director of um, Perfect magazine. All right, so we'll, let's get started. Um, I think first, I think it's sort of a sweet irony um, that we've kind of come full circle. Alessandro Michele started his career at Gucci actually 20 years ago, loosely, but started his career as the creative director um, sort of with this uh, 2015 menswear collection. So we sort of come full circle. Um, and before we kind of get into the current collection, I think it, it might be interesting to just kind of zoom out a little bit and think about the influence that he's had, not only in, I'd say, Gucci's archive and Gucci's um, brand, but sort of, I think, the measure of a, a, a really impactful designer is when it reaches outside of the fashion industry, which I, I think that Alessandro Michele has. And I guess it would be interesting to just think about some of the influences that he's had over his seven-year um, tenure. And I mean, the first things that come to mind are, you know, would we have um, this kind of newly found obsession with more mass obsession with vintage, gender bending? I'm thinking Harry Styles, Jerry Leto. Um, I'm thinking of some of the kind of more impactful uh, collections we've seen. Um, but let's talk about it. What do, what do you think? Do you think, do you think Gucci will kind of return to something like Alessandro Michele in this new era, or do you think it will kind of move in a different direction? I personally think it won't return to Alessandro's aesthetic because they actually want to go in a more commercial direction. Um, so I heard under the grapevine, sort of through the grapevine actually, that one of the reasons why Alessandro left was because they wanted to go in a more commercial direction and he didn't really want to go that way. Um, and it's kind of strange because I looked at the financial report and Q3 last year, they made 2.6 billion euros. And that's more than they made in Q3 in 2021, which was 2.1 billion euros. So it's like you're making money, you're earning financial, and you still want to go more commercial. And it really shows that fashion is going in this like super commercial growth over, you know, aesthetic and actually a brand with meaning. Um, and so unfortunately, I think they're going away from Alessandro's aesthetic and they're going more commercial. But some of that maybe is understandable because brands do want to change things up sometimes. Um, what do you think, Mandy? Do you think we're going in a different... I think it's very long overdue. I mean, I got fatigued with this very early on. I wasn't the biggest fan. Mm -hmm. um, I found it just logo heavy and just flogging the same aesthetic season after season. It just didn't really appeal to me. Um, and I'm actually really excited about all the musical chairs that's going on now. I mean, obviously they're touting J.W. Anderson, Grace Wells Bonner, but Grace Wells Bonner, the chatter seems to be more Louis Vuitton. But I'm actually really excited about the change and it will be completely different for sure. Mm. What do you think, Andrew? I really liked the new show. I, I think, we, as Mandy said, we're ready for like a breath of fresh air. It was like, how many more times can we see like Memphis, witchy, goth princess team, you know, like, and all those loaded references. And I think this is a really nice modern palette cleanser, a really fresh way to show like some Gucci bangers, some really good classics. Um, I think definitely, yeah, we were, we were ready for something new. Um, I'm still undecided, actually. I mean, I, I get the, the sort of the strategic move and the paring down and sort of the moving away from sort of maximalism, but it feels, there's, there's something about it that feels a bit sad, that feels a bit, I don't know, we're sort of losing a bit of a story, but perhaps um, in time it will, the aesthetic will sort of still be the same, but maybe just slightly pared down. So maybe it's just tweaks and not, you know, something a bit more harmonious in the middle. Well, I think it's interesting that you see his shoes still on yeah, the Yeah, I thought so that was really nice. He started off as an accessories designer. Yeah. And I always had the feeling that the clothes were secondary. They were kind of just accessories to the accessories. 100%. Or that they were themed by the accessories, that it was like the scarf and the bag and the shoes and the glasses were more important. And to your point, 
huge drivers in commercial success, right? So I think it's interesting to think about those points, like how will that be integrated or not? You know, if we get like more, a more minimalist designer to come in and we think that, will the clothes become the focal point? Um, what will be, I think also the, the rise of vintage and this kind of obsession with Tom Ford era Gucci, has that affected their thinking? Do they want to go back to something like that? Um, and also I think whenever something goes to like minimalism and we talk about menswear, it always kind of, it, it, it then sort of all blushes blemishes sort of like blends into three brands so suddenly like Gucci looks a little bit like Celine and Celine looks a little bit like Saint Laurent and then that's when I'm a bit like well then what are we you know I don't need to see 14 different Breton um, tops it, it sort of bores me so I think we need to yeah that's show, probably what it this was. This show reminds me of you know at the end of the season when everyone's got designer fatigue yeah and <laughs> all the people in the industry and backstage they actually start wearing all their shit clothes yeah and almost like when they get back to london or on the last day of fashion week they start wearing all their like high street stuff and they don't actually care how they look because they've had enough and i just think that there was a real fame musical come go see vibe to it especially with those um leg warmers in the boots type thing. I kind of like that because it was almost like, um, you know, it's like we don't care, we want to be relaxed, we want to be cool. And I just love, I love restraint. And that was, I found this show so refreshing after everything else. It was like, oh my God, here we go. And the, I thought the bags were amazing. The big oversized bags. Um, and it's a bit like at Bottega when everyone went nuts about Kate Moss in the check shirt and the jeans. I still can't believe that both of those were very, very fine, thin leather. Um, it's almost like that kind of low, low keyness. I think restraint is more impactful now. We need that era, or at least the palette cleanser of it. I think there's a wind of change. I think Daniel Lee's Burberry is going to be simple, beautiful, crafted, very like his Bottega. And I think that's what we need in Menzo at the moment. I'm ready for that shift. I'm ready to go back to something that's a little bit more wearable, easier on the eye. I don't think that people need to be spending and doing these crazy shows. It's 2023, you know, we're all living in really difficult times. And I like that restraint and that respect for what's going on in the world. I think it's really important. And I think there's a lot of the houses will follow this. I think it'll be quite a similar theme where you'll just, it'll be, you'll see what you're getting. Yeah, it does feel like you know, the, the collections that he was, they were very personal to his aesthetic, right? And to his vision to such a degree. I actually, I was trying to remember, you know, you, you really have to go quite far back to think of designers that made it so personal. I think it's quite an old fashioned thing to be that personal. And um, I think that you're right. I think there's an element of it feeling this, this collection uh, that we saw feels it's not that it feels generic, but it definitely doesn't feel that it's a reflection of a single person's vision in the way that it has up until now. And that is kind of interesting. It gives the people wearing it a chance to maybe, you, you know, in the notes, which I found quite hard to read, um, it does talk about styling. The focus is about styling, right? It's about how you wear it and less about somehow this prescription of this is how you should wear it, which is interesting. I find I, that, sorry, I was, I was going to say, I find that really interesting because um, the whole aspect of Gucci since Alessandro went there has been about styling. Like I remember watching the first show and then watching style.com after and people were saying, this looks like the vintage clothing that you can buy in like the corner shop in London in Brick Lane. And it's quite funny because I have a lot of friends who watch Gucci runway shows and then go thrifting and then replicate the looks that they see on the runway. So I've always felt like throughout Alessandro's time, it's always been about styling and how things are put together. But also that was the beauty of it. It was like, you know, you can replicate and duplicate that look yourself on a budget mm -hmm. and not have to pay those kind of yeah, prices. Yeah, it became a whole TikTok yeah. kind of group. Also, it just felt a bit more, sorry to interject, it just felt a bit more individual. What I sort of find and struggle with the new collection is that it feels really uniformly. And I think in a time when people's voices need to be heard and expression feels really important, is this the way that we should be going? But maybe it's just, you know, it's early days and perhaps it will move into something that I find a bit more comfortable with. But I think, the I mean, the design team are an incredible team of kids, you know, from all over the world. And I'm sure this isn't the ideal thing that they wanted to send out, but... It, it's a placeholder. They're being told Do you think maybe to do. instead of this 
very beautifully worded um, poetry in the press release. Have just said we were doing the best we could under the circumstances. Might have been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More, yeah. Um, we were improvising. We were winging it. Um, but I. But you're right. It, I. I think that this is Italian craftsmanship. You know, don't be. Don't be confused. There's still beautiful work. I liked your example actually. With, you know, sometimes it's, it's simplicities um, fools you because there's actually a lot of complexity there. Um, the, the design team is probably, you know, all the cool graduates anyway, mm-hmm. you know, so they're, they're going to be hooked into um, the right kind of references. Um, but I think with, I, I love this whole freestyle thing. I think that fashion is so prescriptive and it's almost like you want such and such a piece, but I love the idea that how you wear it so you can buy something and someone else can wear it differently. I find that so refreshing. It's almost like treating the customer as a civilian Mm -hmm. rather than someone who's going to be putting on a uniform Mm -hmm. and and masquerading as the customer. Although when we see it in magazines, it's going to be like that. So it's going to look like a uniform. Well, you know, it's a really good point because I... I, That's that's my point. Because, you know, the question is like, who is this for? Who is this collection for? Who's the customer that they have in mind? Is it the traditional customer? Is the customer that bought Alessandro Michele ready to move on to this? this I like think the it's graduate? an older customer. I think they've got so, that customer. They think that customer's buying bags and shoes and belts and accessories. And this is, they've lost that core older customer because I can look at this now, you know, and I can see coats that I'd like to buy. I've not seen a Gucci coat oh, that I've wanted coat. to buy. In- incredible, beautiful coats. In- you know, the jeans were great. I've not been able to do that for a long time. And also I think there was a shift in like some of the celebrities were older, you know, Idris Elba and his wife, Nick and Susie Cave, you know, like people that <laughs> I feel like more of my generation in a way. So I think that it's a definite shift looking at an older customer, definitely. That, that got me really worried, actually, because when I saw the, <laughs> the mature couples on the front row, I thought, oh, my God, here we go. Peter, <laughs> Peter Lindbergh, 1996, with uh, Demi Moore and Bruce Willis. Um, and then we saw Perry Hines White um, from Wednesday, Marco Bizzeri was almost clinging on to him, which I found, again, you know, it's like, that's an insecurity thing. You know, that's, maybe that's who's going to be in the campaign. I know I think Jenny is from Wednesday will definitely be at the women's show. She was wearing Gucci at the Golden Globe. And so there's I supposed think, to be a couple as well. I, th- I think that's sewn up already. And that's the girl at the moment that everyone seems to want. I think that's the one they've all been fighting over. Interesting. Is, is anyone cooler than Nick? Cave and Susie Big. I know. No. <laughs> However I mean, old they are. No. W- watching the live stream and seeing the pair of them and then yeah, seeing just Idris, amazing. I was like, I'm, I'm in. I love this. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. I mean, it's interesting. I think the brands, um, in the wake of the kind of, in those early years, so let's go back, let's really rewind a little bit and go to that maybe first season, second season of <clears throat> Gucci. And it really felt, it did feel like a change. Whether it was your personal aesthetic or not, I think it felt um, it felt different, it felt new at the time. Oh yeah, he had three days to put that together. It was three days and they'd got nothing ready. And there was a women's pre-collection that they were working on and that's what that was, a women's pre-collection put on boys. <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, did that, did that first collection, let's say maybe not the men's, or if, the, if you registered the men's collection, great. What did that first September show, did that mean anything to you or did it feel more like? The one, it, the, the men, this one that was in January, people were silent. There were five of us that jumped up, myself, Katie, Anders, Christian Madsen, Ben Red and Luke Day, a few of us jumped up, but a lot of people were just like, what was that? And we were, we were, we were in already. We were like, this is, this is genius. We wanted but Katie this. was familiar with him anyway. And she, Katie had worked with him. Team. She was the only person that was let backstage. So she ran backstage, she chatted to him. And I think she said something like, look, number one was amazing. We got to Paris and I picked Katie up to go to a show and she was standing there. And I was like, God, what, what she did? And he'd made her look number one and he'd sent it to her so that she could wear it on the first day of Paris. And I thought that was really great. That way that, and he, that was the way that he worked. He would communicate with the press himself, you know, as well as his teams doing things. He was a very personable person. And I think that was a really important thing about his kind of t- time there. Mm. He made it more accessible in some ways. Yeah. yeah. But that, I mean, I was like, oh my God, you've got look number one on. That's amazing. Of course. And then I think a lot of brands tried to replicate that 
kind of uh, that yeah. turnaround, right? It felt like actually almost sometimes just a bit like, oh God, here yeah. we go again. It was that shift but that we felt when Hedy started doing Saint Laurent and then Dior. It was yeah. that kind of a shift in menswear. Agreed. Um, yeah, it was, it was really important. And then the women's kind of continued and then it snowballed from there. It just become more and more loaded. I mean, I think for under, I mean, most designers, just the frequency of collections that they have to produce, there often is this bleed. I always feel like menswear collections, um, they can be like a testing ground sometimes in a, in a very particular way, or they can be the inspiration, depending on how you look at it. Um, how do you sort of see, do you, let's, let's do some predictions now. Let's go in the future. Where, where do we think this next September women's wear collection will be? I mean, obviously there has to be some speculation of who do we think is going to be there? Do we think it's just going to be the, the studio team again? Do we think they're going to place someone by then? Anyone want to make a, a guess? I like think it? it's, it's quite interesting because I do like this collection in terms of going in a different direction for Gucci, but at the same time, I don't really think this collection has a lot of an identity. So a lot of these clothes, I can see other designers doing them. So like the exaggerated shoulders, they look like Balenciaga. There's a look with um, like silver trousers, those skin, it just reminds me of Adi Sliman. Um, so when it comes to the women's wear, I have no idea what they're going to do because this is almost like a sort of transition collection in a way. Also, there's not many, people out of contract and available that could just jump into the job. There's a few great young designers maybe that, that should be at Gucci that, you like know, who? do their own collection. And Let's not make a... some suggestions if they're listening. Hello, Gucci. Mandy, who do you think? Well, the chatter is um, Jonathan Anderson, but he's already got, already got Lueve unless his contract's up soon. Um, but, um, and then Grace Wells Bonner and Lou Leaf was saying that the whole buzz at this show was people gossiping about who's going to take Is it going to be, you know? yeah. But, you know, this whole thing about relationships and having a creative director at a maison, you know, some of, you know, it goes back to the way that the Chinese, you know, employ people just for regular jobs. You know, they, they don't want to meet them at a cocktail party. They want to watch them at a cocktail party or they want to build a relationship with them, which, you know, you don't just want to get to know somebody over, over a weekend in a, in a, in a sunny, um, weekend at their palazzo or something. You can't get to know somebody. You've got to build the relationship. Um, and, it, and also, we don't know whether Marco's going to be there much longer either. So there's lots of... Well, there was I think just an they, announcement think, that said he's I think staying. Announced, Pino announced that he was staying the yeah, other but day. That's, but, yeah, but you never that's know. the right yeah. thing to say, isn't it? You know, and also, when you're having a change and a new person comes in, it's actually very healthy and positive to change that infrastructure. Yeah. You know, you don't want... You know, I'm just imagining someone like Grace Wells Bonner, who I don't, I don't think would be going to this, but... You know, you were talking about identity and personal. You know, the designers I really love and cherish at the moment are Bianca Saunders, Samuel Ross, um, Martine Rose, and they are they are absolutely um, dressing a personal vision, mm -hmm. and it's just loaded with authenticity. And and Martine Rose, how many days ago was that show at Pity? Mm -hmm. She's just still really streaming cool. on every every. Um, Instagram, TikTok, it's just been incredible. And that's, I know that she's got investment from tomorrow, um, but, you know, that is what I call an independent label. And I just, I, you know, just look at the brand values and what she's got going on into every orifice of that of that business. I can say it exactly the same for Grace Wells Bonner. Mm -hmm. It's just a very tight, or it's, low, it's so authentic, you know, whereas I never really found Gucci like that under... Alessandro. What's so interesting though is what you said is kind of my issue with this Gucci collection because like a lot of the silhouettes they look like Martin Rose to me but when I look at Martin Rose okay I know it's inspired by London in the 80s and the tailoring and I also know he's inspired by rave culture and she mixes all of that but when I look at this I don't it's the same silhouette but without the same you know ideas behind it so then it becomes less strong and it's like if I have to choose between buying a Gucci coat or a Martin Rose coat that looks similar, I always choose the Martin Rose one because I know where the influence is coming from and it's richer in terms of the references. So that's why it becomes a bit confusing, like who is this collection for? Because 
I see so many designers that do the same thing that I'm seeing in this collection, but just better. But I think that core customer that buys a bamboo bag at an airport, <laughs> they don't care who the creative director is. They don't care who does hair and makeup, who the stylist is, if it was at the Gucci hub or if it was on Mars, they don't care. That they're, they're into that label already. Do you know what I mean? I think it's a very insular world that we live in that we, we care about people and their references and all of that. But I think, yeah. That, but that customer could be alienated by this collection. Um, I, I think it's so normal that maybe it couldn't offend anybody. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I think one of the things, again, coming back to, I'm, I'm not saying that the Alessandra Michele's collections were my, necessarily spoke to me personally, but I, all in gray. But I would say though, that I think there was always um, a cleverness in terms of, you know, you'd have this crazy ensemble, but there was almost a tech, like an understanding that a customer would buy one piece of that. Yeah. Very few customers, and there were probably some, would buy everything. So it was like, yeah. again, the clothes were a backdrop uh, for the bag, for the glass. For, so it was more about, um, I mean, he, he's, he studies as a costume designer, right? So there's a theatrical um, stage setting quality. Obviously, you've got, you know, the show where you have little, you know, the models held their versions of their heads under their arms. I mean, come on, this is insanity, right? It's yeah, like yeah. something out of... It's yeah, art. Yeah. It is. I mean, in a way it is. I mean, I just think it's more, it almost feels more like, like theater, you know, yeah, like theater. Incredible, but made to be memorable to sell belts. To sell bags, to sell shoes. And he did, right? Yeah. So resonate, yeah, yeah. resonate on the gram. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we can't underestimate that. I think, um, and that, that came at the right time for all that as well. Definitely. I mean, the definitely. revenue was just in, insane. And actually the biggest markets, um, has been US and China bigger than they ever had before. Um, and I think that's been the danger of the popularity of it because caring as a, as a, as a holding company, um, it was relying too much on Gucci profits. Mm -hmm. And that's always a dangerous thing, you know, to kind of have your, so the shareholders were just putting so much pressure on it. It had to burst at some point soon. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think, you know, I'm impressed that you looked at the revenue. Um, I had that feeling, though, anyway, without knowing it, that it seemed like, you know, why break up what was effectively a really successful commercial enterprise? And I'm not sure it was, I, I don't know, we can only speculate, because it feels kind of like a breakup, right? It feels like a breakup. I think, I wonder if it has more to do with what you guys were saying. It's just like, there's just only so far you can it's so much about the relationship it's so personal there's just only so far and i imagine it got tricky to, to also he's probably exhausted something new. yeah it's like yeah so it's harry styles and jared leto bow out now instead of having a breakdown and doing something that you regret do you know right, what i mean right and we've i mean you know you said andrew through difficult times and it's been a hard couple two three years and i wonder if now we want more from our clothes if we want to be comforted if we want there's sort of the experience of our clothes to feel also more of an internal experience, more yeah. as, as much as an external one. I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I feel like it would make sense. Well, first of all, I think the Adidas collaboration was incredible. Mm. I thought that was something that just really worked. My first reaction was, oh my God, this works. Mm -hmm. And it was a really interesting original take on the whole thing. So I really salute him for that. Um, yeah, I loved the hacker one as well. I thought that was really, oh, yeah. that was yeah. really clever. Smart. I was like, wow, you take those two people, put them in a room, and that's what you get. That's brilliant. And they've become collector's pieces, and they were great pieces to shoot. You could hardly get them, but they were great pieces <laughs> to shoot when you did get them. Um, also, I think the, the casting was a really important thing. He, the casting shift, we were looking at these traditional beautiful models and he kind of shifted it to, you know, this sensibility where people aren't perfect and there's something a bit strange in that geek, that outsider. I loved that, that he, he brought that He launched a lot of new, mo new yeah. era models, for think, sure. Let's think of like, okay, you know, uh, Ellie Goldstein, the model that he used with Down syndrome. I mean, even the whole aesthetic around having someone smiling with like gaps in their teeth and just, I think you're right. I think that the aesthetic of imperfection, I'm not, you know, it's sort of say, did he start that? But I think he certainly put it on a grand stage. He used his, the brand's popularity, which at that point was definitely at its height, to sort of champion a different aesthetic, something that felt more, definitely more inclusive. But there were also some points of controversy. Um, you know, the, I remember actually watching the, the collection where the models were in straight jackets and thinking, 
I don't think everything is okay at Gucci right now. I don't think that man is a happy in a happy place. I didn't, I didn't quite get that one. And you know, there was a model that protested, you know, just even making mental health something sort of gimmicky for a fashion show. You know, she. Could I remember you, at the could time, you the most? it felt I was like, oh, oh, did he plan that? And then and it wasn't until afterwards I was like, no, no, no. She she was letting it be known that she felt that that was a step too far. And I kind of understand that too. Yeah. But I, I do think I remember, that was the point where I thought, is everything okay? Is it, how is, how is it going over there? Like what's, what's the vibe? What's, what's going on? Um, but yeah. I but don't, I'm, oh, sorry. I'm really curious to see who would go there. I'm, yeah, that's all we're bothered about. I don't think, I don't <laughs> think anyone is going to. I think they're going to keep the design team for quite yeah. a while, and I think they're going to have which guest is, people which in there will, instead. Which will develop. I mean, yeah, yeah definitely. But if you if you work out that a, a creative director is around ten million a year, so half a year they save five million. They go another season, they saved another five Look million. What happened with Calvin Klein and Raph? Right? It's a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, Calvin Klein was a sorry state. And also, I think I don't know. I think when something is so not one note, but when something is so sort of like stuck in our minds, like we're so familiar with that aesthetic, it's going to take a really long time for that to shift. Like right now I look at Gucci and I go, oh, it doesn't really make any sense. And I'm not sure if I like it, but I'm sure I'll marinate over it and then come round like everybody else. But I am, um, yeah, I think the customer and everybody else needs a bit of time. Yeah. And, that, and that design team needs a bit of time as well to kind of find their own feet. Yeah. I think we're probably being a bit overcritical of this particular collection. It is a placeholder collection. Yeah, like a palate um, cleanser. And, and for a palate cleanser, it, it, it's it's refreshing after all the kind of, you know, hyper saturated, mm -hmm. you know, that same look season after season with the and all the logos. It was just you know this restraint. Um, also, I'm really excited to see what he does next. Yeah. Is it going to be an artist like Helmut Lang did and totally you know drop that out of? Bag? I read in one of the reviews that they said it was crocodile or something, and I thought that Gucci or Caring is fur free. Oh, is yeah, that right? I don't. You know, or maybe that's... it's simulated crocodile. I don't yeah. know. Well, that's a question, Caring. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you think? Do you think? Though, coming back to what you're saying, you, so you think that the next collection could also be studio designed? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. I do. I think they're very constant. That's that amazing team. jacket, isn't it? I think yeah. throwing someone in the deep end um, like this is—it would be a huge mistake and lots and lots of pressure on, a de on yeah. any designer that they pick that's out there at the moment. Um, I think everybody needs to find their feet and recalibrate, mm. and perhaps this is the start of that. Also, they might promote from within. You know, yeah. there's there's a head of design that worked there all the time with yeah. him, and they might give him the job. I think when Tomorrow first invested in 2001 in Martine Rose, you know, they, they were very much, you know, when they announced it, it was very much all about um, allowing um, Martine to do what she needed to do and not put the pressure on her about developing and making commercial, but actually allowing her authenticity to just breathe and give her the inf in infrastructure to um, grow as a designer. And that's why I get really excited about people like, someone like Grace Wells Bonner, imagine, because she hasn't really been at a Maison before. And, and what you get when you shift from your own label to um, being somewhere where, you know, you've got a shred of fabric that you want it in a certain way, and it goes back and comes back all embellished how you precisely want that luxury. She hasn't even had that yet. So someone like that, it could be an amazing shift, you know, of gears for her. You, you, and almost like, look what she's done so far. I imagine what she can do when she's got that infrastructure around her. I think you're right. I mean, there's that the finishing and all the all that kind of uh, the time. She would never compromise. She would never do like a 120 look collection yeah. just because she had to tick that box. <laughs> yeah. And her temperament as a person, um, she kind of commands quite a lot of respect. She's quite intense. But, I mean, she's she's very funny and cute, but she is quite intense. And I can't imagine her. You know, this generation of designers like her, Bianca, and 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 Samuel going anywhere. Where, where they're expected to be battery hands. I was, I was just going to say that because, um, like with Martine Rose, for example, she skips shows. So she feels like she doesn't have something to say. She just won't do a show. Um, and that's so refreshing to see someone that's not just forcing things, 
just because it's fashion week or just because you have to make a certain amount of collections in a year. And I found that really refreshing. And I think that was a difficult part of Alessandro's collections because it seemed as though he was doing so many things, so many collaborations that sometimes designers don't have time to develop their aesthetic, which is why the collection started to look a bit similar and his signatures became a bit too stagnant. Um, and that, then you get into Galliano territory where they, have, they, they, they almost like need to lose it just to kind of reset their life. <laughs> I mean, do, do brands even need creative directors? I think they need ideas people, definitely, because the businessmen are suits with no style. They ju it's just about money, you know? So you need someone with a vision that's well-traveled, cultured, to kind of, you know, say, let's sh show in Rome, let's show in France, you know, let's show here, you know, let's, let's do this, let's build this set, let's get that musician. I, I don't think the CEO would have known who that band was before mm -hmm. the design team would have gone, there's this really cool band. He probably didn't know who they were. And then... <laughs> <at> the... <laughs> but you, I think you need a figurehead. And also, you know, with most, uh, you know, wherever I've worked in my trajectory, you always want to be inspired by people around you. Um, you kind of need ment subliminal mentors the whole time. You can't just stay stagnant. So you need a figurehead to kind of G up the team. And then that figurehead, who's like the god of, god of the house, um, you know, they then become inspired by the team. And then you get the real synergy. I think it helps with the myth of fashion because... A lot of times like we praise creative directors as like this godly figure, like you said, but there'll be a footwear designer that's designed the footwear and someone who's yeah. in charge of the menswear, who's specifically designed a lot of the menswear looks. And so I think it's easier for people in fashion to just like attribute all this stuff to one person but it takes rather than, live. yeah, this person did this, this but I think that's less sexy, which is why it's good to have a creative director. I just think it helps with the, the story of fashion. That's what I love about Kim Jones, you know, he always, you know, is always like promoting the team and, you know. He, yeah, you, you can know, see those kids. He, he even looks after them like, I, you know, when I remember going to a talk in London a couple of years ago and he was saying how, you know, even the, what they were being paid, if he didn't think they were being paid enough, he would negotiate that they got more money. You know, he really looks after his team and I think, you know, he's just a shining example of really great machinery. I mean, this team can still challenge him. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. I mean, wrapping our, our discussion kind of <clears throat> down a little bit, do you think that um, just looking at the influence that Alessandro Michele's had, sounds like we agree that it's time to make a change for the brand. And I think we can see the influence he's had in the fashion industry, outside of the fashion industry. Do we think that's going to continue on past his time at Gucci, I mean, some of that maybe depends on what he does next, to your point, Andrew, but do we feel like that's gonna continue this kind of gender bending, vintage mixing kind of, do we feel like that's done with him or will it continue on with it without him, for example? I think a watered down version is going to continue. I think people who kind of work in, and are in fashion and people who are fans of fashion will, you know, continue to fly those flags. But I think I think at the end of the day, money is a, the primary concern and people want to make as much money as possible. So they, they want to make it as digestible as possible, don't they? So I think that's the direction it'll go. Yeah, but those airport shops like Andrew mentioned yeah. earlier, I remember, remember being at Gatwick and they had one of those shops and it was literally like a kiosk. It was a whole shop and it was just phone covers and those awful trainers with the Well, that's what spot. people can afford, isn't it? You want to buy into that lifestyle, but really you can't because who's buying one of those coats? You, you're like, you know, we'd all love a sequined blazer, but that's but, but going to set you back like seven grand. <laughs> so, you, so you get a piece of it, don't you? You get the sunglasses, you get like the phone case, you get the weird, ugly shoe. Um, so you can kind of be part of that gang in the loosest term possible. When the, when the marginal utility falls, you know, is saturated, that's when, you know, it just backfires on you. And I think that's what they've done. They've kind of gone down to the level, to the kind of lowest demographic when they should, when they should keep, you know, I, I just think they tried to make too much money. And that was the issue with Tom Ford, wasn't it? Yeah. When he came in and he tried to really pair back, like all that, just Gucci being everywhere and it being oversaturated. 
Um, and it's always going to be a problem. Like there's like a, a fine point where if you pass that and your brand becomes oversaturated, very quickly people don't care. And you have to play this game where you're sort of constantly staying in the middle of that. And I think right now, yeah, they are getting a bit oversaturated. And I do, I am a big fan of Alessandro's work. Um, I just think that at Gucci itself, it was starting to stagnate. But I am quite curious to see where he goes or what he does. Oh, I'd love to see Alessandro Chanel. I think that would be a really nice pairing. I think oh, it'd be re really, that really interesting. Goosebumps in, just there. How was it really, seen? really, in, really, really interesting. And I think in a way, he's he's preparing himself for a job like that. And I think he might, you know, he's out of contract now. Yeah. I think there are a few designers that are after that I job. think he might go into interiors. I feel like that's... Or even interiors would be amazing. Or art. I think he'd be, he'd be an amazing artist. I think his ideas and the way he presents things are incredible. And, and lastly, <clears throat> what are our predictions? I know we talked about this a little bit, but what, if, if let's just assume Gucci's listening. Who would we like to see at the helm in September if they choose to put someone at the helm in September? Just as your wish list, who would you like to see there? I'd like to see Martine. Yeah, I think I'd like to see Martine. I vote for Martine as well. I think she'd be amazing. How about you guys? What, what about I, you guys? I find it fascinating that the same designers are being speculated for Gucci and yeah. Louis Vuitton. So yeah. like J.W. Anderson, Grace Wells Bonner, Martine Rowe. I just find it really interesting because they're completely different brands. But yeah, I guess those are the people that are available slash we just think can move versus a lot of designers seem to be sort of tied down to what they're doing, um, which is why there is. And also I've heard um, Sharaf from Casablanca also be put into that list of names. Um, so yeah, it's just really interesting. What you were saying about, um, you know, Alexander Michele and Genji Neutral and all this kind of thing, uh, you know, uh, he might have opened some doors in that respect, but it's very much the new wave and the new generation. I mean, all the designers I know are very mu much projecting that and, and, um, you know, this is, this is the kind of norm for this generation. This is how the trends are changing. One of the things that struck me about this show actually with kind of how um, the designers we really respect are presenting themselves is it wasn't really the most diverse show at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought there were very few black and South Asian designers. Um, that kind of st stuck out for me a little bit. Mm. That's a very good point, actually. I think diversity is something that it's like, I feel sometimes that a diversity of body shape, diversity of, of any kind, it sort of feels like it kind of dips. It's an optional sometimes, which is I thought we learned those lessons already, but it feels like maybe we haven't yet. Any thoughts on that? Um, <laughs> if Gucci's listening? I don't know. Get, get, I think it's just how, how that one happened to be, wasn't it? I mean, it's just, it's, it's I, I get so bored of talking about it because I say the same thing everywhere I go all the time and nothing seems to have changed. That was quite dramatic. Um, <laughs> I, I, that was like a mic throw down. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see more of different conversations, but in order to have different conversations, you need different people. So perhaps the merry-go-round of designers that we have need to be opened up a bit, like everything else. <laughs> I think that's actually probably almost a good point This issue is magnified, on. of course, by the incredible casting at Martine Rose. <laughs> 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 All Rose Lee back to Martine. <laughs> True. Brilliant. Um, well, I think that that's probably, anyone have any last thoughts? Any, anything you'd like to finish on? I think that we'll wrap up from there. Um, think Gucci, think Martine, think... It was very cool that Jeremy O'Harris was in the audience at Gucci wearing the hacker bag and the dungarees from the twin collection. Yeah, that is brilliant, actually. I like that about the show. <laughs> Well, I have a feeling people are still going to buy Gucci bags at the airport lounge, no matter who's in charge. Exactly. Yeah. They're fine. It's, you know, it's and I think this was a shop of phone cases and those waspy trainers. Well, I would say, though, in defense whole of that very thing, that one of the reasons why he was so powerful as a, as a cultural force was that he went all the way across. You know, people who couldn't buy into anything else could buy a phone case. And that's probably why he had as much influence culturally as he did is he wasn't just staying within a fashion bubble. And I think that that, that has some merit. I think it has value. So I, I'll be interested to see what he does with that, if he takes that where he goes next. I think what interests me the most actually about this is, 
Alessandro McKellar has been there for so long, like since 2002. So he's been there with Tom Ford. He's been there with Frida. And then he was inside the design team when he got hired as the creative director. And they're not really going to replicate someone now who understands the brand to that level. Um, so it'll be really interesting, whoever comes, how that's going to change things. I think with all the musical chairs, though, it's almost like Ferragama is so exciting because of Max and Matthew Blasey at Bottega. So it's like all these musical chairs, it just... It kind of gives us, gives us all the jolt to keep our own interest in these brands. I just think it's a really exciting time for change. Andrew, any last thoughts? Um, I'd just like to applaud the design team. I think they did something yeah. really special. I think they did a really great job. I mean, what, what a tough gig to do after such a successful person. And I think they did something quite, quite great. Okay. What about you? Do you have any last? No, no. No, not really. I'm just, yeah, let's, let's, looking forward to seeing I what's next. I want the next. big bag. You want the big bag? All right, we want the big bag. I want the big our last pastel as a group. pink bag. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. And that's it. And a round of applause to Alessandra McKellar as well. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great legacy.